Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. I want to share a few things with you here today that I think are interesting. Executives of a greeting card company wanted to try a little experiment and they thought it would be good, you know, publicity. And so they decided that they would set up a little booth at a state prison. And at this state prison booth, they offered the prisoners a chance to send a card, you know, free of charge to their mother. Well, believe it or not, the lines were so long that they actually had to go and get more cards because almost every prisoner wanted to send a card to his mother. Well, this was such a large success that they thought, okay, when Father's Day comes, let's do the same thing. We'll offer them a chance to send cards to their, to their father. Well, amazing to them, no one showed up at the booth. No one. And when they questioned the prisoners about it, they told them that they said, well, we don't know who our father is. Now that says something, doesn't it? That in itself. We don't know who our father is. My closest friend in the ministry uh, is a black pastor in Pittsburgh. And uh, he just retired. And he had a children's ministry there. And at one point he had 93 children in that ministry and 90 of them had only a mother. 90 out of 93 children only had a mother, no father. And we wonder why our world is in the state that it's in today, right? You know, kids uh, have names for fathers, right? And I think they go through four stages. I was thinking about this myself and I wrote them down here, you know. When kids are little, they call you Dada, right? Hi, da da, da da, and then we're so happy, right? Oh my gosh, they called me. You know what I mean by my name, right? And then they get a little older and they call you daddy. And then when they get a little older and they want the car and things, then it's dad, right? It gets more serious. You know, dad, can I have the car? You know what I mean? I want to take this girl out on a date or whatever. You know that type of thing. Or, um, and then you know when they mature. They call you collect. Right? Unfortunately, there's a little too much truth in that today. I'm going to share this with you. I actually didn't write this one, although I write poetry. But there are so many things I'd like to tell you face to face. I either lack the words or fail to find the time or place, but in this special letter, Dad, you'll find at least in part the feelings that the passing years have left within my heart. The memories of childhood days and all that you have done to make our home a happy place and growing up such fun. I still recall the walks we took, the games we often played, those confidential talks we had while resting in the shade. This letter comes to you, Dad for needed words of praise, the counsel and the guidance too that shape my grown-up days. No words of mine can tell you, Dad, the things I really feel, but you must know my love for you is lasting, warm, and real. You made my world a better place, and through the coming years, I'll keep these memories of you as cherished souvenirs. There's not a day that goes by, my dad went to heaven, um, in 2008 and there's not a day that goes by that I don't think about you know what would dad say or what would dad do you know if he were here I don't think at least once um, and I thank God that I had a good dad many many children don't have that I have a little list of ABC's here I want to share with you also and then I'll get into the actual sermon message uh, for today um, and these are ABCs concerning fatherhood and most of them are developed because I've seen the opposite side the side that didn't work and so the ones that work come out of the ones that didn't work right a always trust them to God's care your children always trust them to God's care B bring them to church you know it drives me crazy I can't tell you the young families in the 23, 24 years that I've been in the ministry, the young families that God used the Holy Spirit through me to bring into church, and they end up and stop coming to church. You know why? Because they ask the kids if the kids want to go to church. 
Sunday morning cartoons or church, right? And you ask your kids. In our house, you didn't, I wouldn't, you, you don't ask. My parents didn't ask, do you want to go to Sunday school? We knew we were going to Sunday school, and you didn't even bring up, right, the idea that, you know, that you might not want to go that day because you knew that the response was not going to be something you would like. You know, so it's just, it drives me crazy. They let these kids make the decisions. Challenge them to high goals is C, D, delight in their achievements. E, exalt the Lord in their presence. F, frown on evil. G, give them love. H, hear their problems. I, ignore uh, not their childish fears. In other words, don't ignore their childish fears that they have. Joyfully accept their apologies for J, K, keep their confidence. L, live a good example before them. Boy, there's a big one right there. Not do as I say, but do as I do, right? They'll, do, they'll follow more what they see you do than what, what you say. Um, M, make them your friends. That one there is important, but don't put that first place. Nowadays, a lot of young fathers fail because they want their kids to be their best friend. Well, that gets kind of muddy then, doesn't it, when you got to discipline them, if I'm their best friend. And it's, you know, and don't misunderstand what I'm saying to them, but you have to keep still the father, son, or daughter relationship there. It's important. Um, N, never ignore their endless questions. O, open your home to their visits and their friends. Our farm was, all the teenagers stopped at our farm, I think, in the area. P, pray for them by name. Q, quicken their interest in spirituality. If you see that they grab onto something, then try to nurture that area that they grab onto. R, remember their needs. S, show them the way of salvation. T, teach them to work. U, understand they are still young. V, verify your statements. W, wean them from bad company. X, this one's a little tough, but I got here, expect them to obey. I was expected to obey. My grandfather would say once, right? You need to do this. And then you know what happened? It was this. What did I say? And the belt started coming off. And you knew at that point, you better jump. Or your butt was going to be sore. You know? We still need some of that. I hate to say it, there's a lot of young people that I've counseled over the years, and I knew all the time that what they really needed was a good trip to the woodshed. And I could have straightened them out right there. Right there. But, of course, you know, you can't do that because that's child abuse. And now I just want to mention something else here. I don't want to get into politics a lot, but parents, wake up, man. Keep track of what's going on in your school because this critical race theory is garbage. Absolute garbage. And make sure that they're not teaching that to your children. You know, it's absolutely ludicrous to tell one color that, you know, you're superior and another color you're inferior. And because you're inferior, you know, you need to attack the one that's superior and the one that's superior needs to apologize for the rest of their life for what their great, 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 great ancestors did. You know, it's just, it's crazy. Just don't, you know, make sure you know what the school's teaching your kids. Why? Yearn for God's best for them and Z, zealously guide them in biblical truth. That is what it's all about, okay? All right, now into our actual sermon message for today here. You know, today nearly 100 years have elapsed since the first Father's Day was actually celebrated. Fathers of 1900 didn't have it nearly as good as fathers of today. But they did have a few advantages, and I just want to share those advantages with you. In 1900, fathers prayed their children would learn English. Most of them because they had come over, right? Um, today, fathers pray that their children will speak English so they can actually understand what they're saying. In 1900, a father's horsepower meant the number of horses that he owned on the farm to get his work done. Nowadays, horsepower means the engine in your minivan or the car or the truck that you drive or the side-by-side -side or the boat, right? How powerful they are. 
In 1900, if a father put a roof over his family's head and food on the table, he was considered a success. And if he was a Christian father and took them to church, then he was considered a success as well. Today it takes a roof, a deck, a pool, you know, a barn, an extra building to put all the extra vehicles in, a four-car garage, uh, insurance for everything, and money for the kids' college as well. And oh, by the way, Dad, you know, the neighbor down the road, he bought, um, you know, his daughter a brand new car when she graduated from high school. So I'm expecting my brand new car as well, right? It's a little different today. In 1900, fathers passed on clothing to their sons. Today, kids won't touch dad's clothes. They don't even want to wear a coat when it's 40 below zero because, you know, it doesn't, it, I don't look right when I wear a coat. You know what I mean? I, 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 it's, you know what I mean? I just, you know, it's not the thing to do, you know, dad. In 1900, fathers and sons would have heart-to-heart -heart conversations while they were fishing in a stream, or with my dad, it was while we were working getting the hay into the barn, we would have heart-to-heart -heart conversations. Today, fathers pluck the headphones off of their children's ears and shout, hey, if you got a second, I'd like to, you know, have a minute just to talk to you. In 1900, children were glad for any help their parents could provide, even if it were used furniture or furnishings and tools. Today, children want everything new, like their neighbors, not realizing that the old was made much better and lasts ten times longer than the stuff that's made today. In 1900, many fathers could uh, choose you know, or count on their children to join the family business. Today, fathers pray their kids will soon come home from college long enough to teach them how to work the computer or how to set the VCR so that they can record, you know what I mean, their most favorite program. You know, that's the truth of it, you know. I hate to say it, but it is. You know, in 1900, children were surrounded by influences and people with high morals which were actually compatible with the church. That's why it was so much easier to grow the church then because the morals were the same in the world basically as what the church was teaching. So some people came to church for the wrong reasons, but after they had a pastor that preached the truth, they eventually, you know, got in line with where they should be, you know, with God's word. Today, to be spiritual in any way is good enough. And truth is a compromise. In other words, let's sit down and talk about it. You tell me what you think truth is, I'll tell you what I think it is. We'll compromise and that'll be truth. Well, that's not truth. We know that. It's not what you want to make it. Truth is truth. In 1900, a father came home from work to find his wife and children at the supper table. Today, the father comes home to a note. Uh, Jimmy's at baseball, uh, Cindy's at gymnastics or dance, and I'm at adult ed, and there's some leftover pizza in the fridge, right? That's the world that we live in today. It's difficult being a father in the world today. It's more difficult to teach proper values today than in years past because of the widespread rejection of Christian principles in our culture. In effect, there are many dissonant voices which feverishly contradict everything for which Christianity stands. And the result is we have a generation of young people who have discarded the moral standards of the Bible. You know, you can go to church three times a week, serve on your governing board, attend the annual picnic, pay your tithes, and make all the approved religious noises and yet somehow fail to communicate to the next generation the real meaning of what Christianity is all about. This mission of introducing one's children to the Christian faith can be likened to, I think, a three-man relay. First, your father runs his lap around the track carrying the baton, which represents the gospel of Jesus Christ. At the appropriate time, he hands the baton to you, and you begin your journey around the track. And then finally, the time will come when you must get the baton safely in the hands of your child. But as any track coach will testify, relay races are won or lost in the transfer of the baton. And if the baton gets dropped, there's a critical moment when all can be lost by just a simple fumble. 
You know, according to my dad, and I heard this so many times, he said, what good will it be for a man if he gains the whole world and yet forfeits his soul? Usually it was when I was frustrated because we were working really long hours and, and, um, and you know, that's from Matthew 16. Of course, um, uh, you know, Luke records it as well. But anyways, for the most part, the faith and faithfulness are not being passed on to our children. The baton is being dropped between generations. Unless my son and daughters grasp the faith and take it with them around the track, it matters little how fast any of us run. If American families are to survive the incredible stresses and dangers they now face, it will be because husbands and fathers provide loving leadership in their homes, placing their wives and children at the highest level on their system of priorities. What does Ephesians say? A man's supposed to love his wife as Christ loved the church. Wow, that's tremendous love. I'm willing to give up my life for my wife and my family. Malachi 4.6 He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers or else I will come and strike the land with a curse. Wow. No more needs to be said there. Huh? 1 Corinthians 16, 13 and 14. Be on your guard, stand firm in the faith, be men of courage, be strong, do everything in love. I'm asking all men to step up and be a man, no matter what God has allowed you to be put in. First, be spiritually alert, and you be alert by that, I mean pray and pray and then pray some more. Second, be strong in the faith. Read God's word so you actually know what it says because you know what? I don't have all the answers and I'm sure you haven't had all the answers as a parent and don't have all the answers. But look to where all the answers are listed and that's in God's word. And you know what? You can never go wrong if you follow God's word and use the advice that's there. Third, be strong spiritually. Take the sacraments. Partake of the Lord's Supper as we will today. Fourth, do everything in Christian love modeled after Christ's love. That is ever so important. Luke 11, 11 and 12. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? You know, God has a way of taking any situation in life, even the worst situations or what we think are the worst situations, and he can work them for good, right? Passing on physical belongings to children, even though, you know, I think about that as well, and I'm sure many of you do, that's not really what's important. What do you want to pass on to your children? And that's what you need to ask yourself. And I would say, leave them a legacy of faith. Let them see that you're human, And that will go with them everywhere. I want our children to have a dad of prayer. You know, I remember seeing my dad pray. He always prayed, and we always prayed in our house at mealtime, and they always made sure that we said our prayers at bedtime. Also, we prayed for others and special needs. And breakfast was the time when the Bible was read. I have my grandfather's Bible yet, and guess what? It's stained with grape jelly. The Bible looks terrible. But it means everything to me because it's, it's so shredded and so wore out, it shows you how much my grandfather read his Bible and how much it meant to him. A dad of patience. You know, correct your children in love. If you love them, Jesus corrects us. God the Father corrects us. We as Christian fathers and grandfathers have to correct our grandchildren. And we just had our grandchildren here recently and our, my little granddaughter was not too happy with me sometimes, but that's okay. You know what I mean? She got over it quick. Because grandpa just won't let her do anything she wants to do and won't buy into little temper tantrums that she has, right? 
Don't expect perfect children. You're not perfect. So we need uh, fathers of patience. Be a dad of purpose as well. Giving and caring for others. Teach them people are more important than things. More important than money. Help them to see that God made you their father for a reason. As God the Father has transmitted his superior knowledge to Job, without either a bill of indictment or a verdict of innocence. A dad of peace. Peace with God, peace with others, and peace with the world. And I add to that when possible. Because we are not to just follow along no matter what our leaders do if they go against God's word. I'm sorry, Romans 13 does not say that. A lot of Christians say, well, I'm supposed to follow because God put the government in place. Well, that's if the government follows God's word. But when the government steps out of line and doesn't follow God's word, no, we don't just follow along like little sheep, you know what I mean, um, and go walking off the cliff with everybody else. And be a dad of play as well. Because your kids will grow up a lot faster than you can even imagine. And you just wonder where the time went. And it's gone. And then my last thing here is be a dad of praise. You know, I'm amazed at how often people complain. And, and that's been one of my worst traits uh, growing up. Uh, and I've tried so hard to work on that. We all have, you know... Um, and I can't think of a greater insult to God than to gripe with the mouth that he created for you to give him praise, right? Doesn't that make sense? The seriousness of Israel's wilderness wanderings reminds us of God's hatred of complaining. As a parent, I frequently complain about things in my children's lives, and my motivation is sincere, I believe. I want them to grow up with good attitudes and habits. And I'm embarrassed, however, by how often I use negative or corrective speech or compared to the amount of praise that I give them. Something that we all can work on. We can all improve here. And I have to tell you, the urgency of this mission of being a father and a grandfather has taken me to my knees, to my knees many times. And I'm sure it will continue to take me to my knees because you know what? They're always your children no matter how old they are or how old you are. Let's bow our heads here and I'd like to pray at this point. Lord, here we are again. You know what we need even more than we do before we ask. When you consider the many requests we've made of you through the years regarding our health and our ministry and the welfare of our loved ones, Lord, please put this supplication at the top of the list. Keep the circle of our little family here unbroken when we stand before you on the day of judgment. Compensate for, Lord, for our mistakes and our failures as parents and counteract the influences of an evil world that would undermine the faith of our children at every turn today, Lord. And especially, Lord, we ask for your involvement when our sons and daughters stand at the crossroads deciding whether or not they're going to walk the Christian path, Lord. And then we pray that you will provide for them someone in that moment that can give you, them a word of encouragement, a friend or a leader to help them to choose the right direction, Lord. They were yours before they were born, and now we give them back to you in faith, knowing that you love them even more than we do. Help us to not receive God's grace in vain, but to pass it on that others may come into God's glorious light. Open our hearts, Lord, as Paul states in 2 Corinthians 6, as a fair exchange, speak as to my children. In Jesus' precious name, amen.